tape. Hey, David. How are you? So, I think it's working on Facebook Live. Can somebody tell me if they're in the group, if it's working on Facebook Live? Working on the hair here. I think I like the way my face looks better on the phone than I do here. Ooh. Okay. I don't see the bags on my phone, but I see them very clearly on the computer. So anyway, I will... Yeah, you're live. I can see you. I'm live. Okay, I'm going to start recording. On this computer recording in progress and I'll let people in as I see them but welcome to my Thursday 6 p.m. discussion of patronomics for those of you that don't know what it is I'm just gonna repeat it also for the video it is a 10-part strategy to grow protect and transfer wealth by marshalling your finite resources which are money energy and time to accomplish those goals most important to you that I call end of life goals, which are those goals that are so pivotal that if you don't accomplish them, you will feel as if your life lacks true purpose. The third part we're going to talk about tonight is who is in your lifeboat? That's the section I call it. And are they helping you row or are they causing you to sink? And how do you know whether or not they're helping? So the first two parts of Pitronomics encompass establishing your goals, and the second part is establishing how to accomplish your goals. So your roadmap, your interim steps that enable you to accomplish what those goals are. Now, it's my hope that once you clearly define what it is you want to accomplish and how you're going to get there, it makes it easy to figure out if the people that you have around you are helping you get in that direction. And that if they're not, it makes it that much simpler to drop them from your priority list. Sometimes you can't actually get them out of your life, but you can drop them from being a priority. So there was a friend of mine who was recently, this past week, speaking to me about some family issues. And hey, Shalena, how's it going? Hello, how are you? Good. So there was a friend of mine speaking earlier about some family issues. She felt that they weren't supportive of her. In fact, they were the opposite of supportive. They were doing everything they could to inhibit her success. And when I was speaking to her about it, she was like, well, what can you do? They're family. And my response is, well, they might share your DNA, but they aren't doing family things for you. They aren't helping you grow. They aren't helping you provide the legacy you want to leave for your kids. In fact, they're doing everything to destroy you emotionally to keep you from accomplishing the things that you want to accomplish. How is that family? And I get that you can't change who is your mother or your father or your sisters and brothers and cousins, but you can certainly impact how much of a priority you let them have with your resources, those finite resources, money, energy, and time that are needed to accomplish your goals. So it took me a while, and by a while I mean probably till about mid-20s, to really be able to say to people, you're just not working to, for me. And it's not that I'm gonna be rude to you, maybe, I was a little ruder. David might be able to attest to that because he's known me a while, but what now? I don't know to say. <laughs> But it becomes really important to extricate those non-helpful people from the top part of your priority in life. So don't let them take up too much of your limited resource of money or your limited resource of time or your limited resource of energy. And that's what my friend was telling me about today. She was just so tired from dealing with her family. She wasn't sleeping well. That lack of energy or that energy drain keeps her from doing whatever it is she wants to do. So any questions, comments, or anybody want to say anything from what I just said there? 
or share a story? Well, right before you said it, when she was talking, when you were talking about her family, I was thinking, oh, they're they're robbing her of her energy, like they're energy vipers, and then you kind of said it. So um, that is something to think about when you're thinking about the people in your, you know, circle. Um, is how do you feel when you leave your presence? Do you feel drained? Do you feel <laughs> energized? You know, things like that. So that's a good. Um, Yes, and I one of the things I do see in people is they find it really hard not only to get those people out that are damaging to their resources, but have trouble bringing in the people that can help them enrich their resources. And so I'm going to share a really personal story. When I was pregnant with my son, that was back in 2002, who he's now 19 and tall. But I had a, an argument with my father. I don't have the best relationship with my father. You know, I tried, I did what I could. I don't know what else it would take to make that relationship as positive as I would like. And I was speaking to him on the phone with him and his current wife. And I got so angry after that conversation, I felt my baby churn in my womb. That anger, that rancor, that vile emotion was causing discomfort to the baby in my body. And I said to myself right then, hey Todd, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to continue to have that energy bring down my health or the health of my baby. Because I know stress and anger aren't good for anyone to carry around. And I know it wasn't good to subject my unborn son to so I actually called a friend, vented, 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 strategized, and then I called my father back and I said, look, I am carrying a child. That should be important to you that you give me encouragement and support and not a whole lot of stress. But if it's not important for you to do that for me, then I am going to sever access that you have to me and my family. And this is not a negotiation. I am not here to you know, figure out how this is going to be. I am now putting a boundary around what I need to keep safe, which is my mental health and the physical and emotional and every part of the safety of my baby. And you're going to have to step outside that boundary. And by the time I said that, it was a lot of relaxing. And any person who has felt that just release of stress knows what I'm talking about. It's like, wow, that wasn't that hard. And so there are many things that people can tell you that decrease your motivation, that decrease your energy. Things like, that's not gonna work for you. You're going to fail at that. That's a bad idea. No one can do it. Here's my answer to that, to the no one can do it. All that means is that person speaking can't do it. That doesn't mean, that doesn't have anything to do with you. Those words have nothing to do with whether or not you can accomplish something. If they think it's a bad idea or not a good idea, that's because maybe it's not a good idea for them. But it has nothing to do with whether or not it's something that can work for you. Here's how you know. If you have done the work to establish your end of life goals, those really important goals that I'm talking about, and you've done the work to figure out what your finite resources of money, energy, and time are, because once you do that math and you figure out you don't have a lot extra to accomplish those lofty goals, I believe without a doubt, you'll say, I do not have time to spend my limited resources on these people right here. I am cutting them out. Once you get there, I think it's very difficult if you lack the direction to be able to cut out that stuff that's causing you harm. But once you have it, once you have the roadmap, I think it's very easy. Is there anyone, and I love to do this, that feels like sharing a story where they found it hard to extricate somebody that was toxic from their life. And then when they did, they felt a whole lot better. I'm gonna do a Shalena. Hey Shalena, you got something for me? Where I did something and, and felt better afterwards? Where you extricated someone no, from your I'm life. <laughs> No, let me turn my video on. 
No, I don't. Here's here's the thing. Cool. That's so. That's a loaded question because do I remove people? Yes. However, uh, um, I don't remove them in the sense of oh, I'm gonna cut you off. You, you you're dead to me. Type. Mm-hmm. I've been there, done that, and it's 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 very um, the thinking. And this is just for me. The thinking behind that is very uh, fourth grade. I'm gonna take my ball and play ground. Y'all can't play. No, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm good. You, we don't need to be in each other's life. If I see you, it's still respect. Um, and I, I just go my way. Your number is still saved in my phone. Um, and I have some people who you can block on social media. I just choose, I chose not to because it takes too much energy to focus on how to remove someone from my life. Let me block them here. Let me delete them here. Let me avoid them here. I don't have time for that. I'm, I'm, my focus is on making money. And helping people, mm-hmm. and so if if we decide that we're no longer a fit for each other's life, that's it. I mean, you see me is hey, you got to put people in categories, and I think the biggest issue is uh, many people have not developed the mental capacity to understand how to emotionally cut someone off. You can emotionally cut someone because, like you, Julie, I didn't have a good relationship with. My, my father, there's actually, you know, a lot of things in there where it, it was extremely toxic and I could have taken the road to, to be super upset, emotional about it. And then that gives him power and control over how I think and how I feel when he does something. And I'm in a space where I can't allow someone to have that much power and that much control over my emotions. And so if you want to act a straight plum fool, then you go in this bucket. If you want to be disrespectful, you go in this bucket. If you if you just do something, you know, once I learn who you are, you're gonna go in a bucket. And I just can't give people that kind of energy to focus on. Let me let me schedule in my calendar a time to cut you out my life. No, baby, you fine. You go do what you need to do, and that scares people sometimes. Well, why is she mad? Is she gonna do something? Like that? No, I just don't have the energy to give to you to focus my mental on figuring out how to cut you out. No, you're, you're, you're fine. Have a blessed day. And that's pretty much where I go with it. Well, but I think, Shalana, we're saying the same things because you're not giving them any more energy. You're not no. giving them any more time. We're not even talking about money here. And no, I like I to think of it... Energy. I don't give them mental space. It's different. Yeah. So mental space is where you sit back and you're thinking about what they did. You're thinking about how it impacted you. You're thinking about how you could have responded or what you could have done differently. It, it cannot take up space in my mind to think about what happened, why it happened that way. I'm going to learn. I'm going to take my learning moment and I'm going to move it forward to the next relationship because I'm thinking about other things versus how you impacted me. Okay. I see what if you're saying. No, I see what you're saying. Um, the little wrinkle I want to add to it is that when you have limited resources, mm-hmm. don't squander them on people that aren't advancing your priorities and don't make them top tier in your life. You don't mm-hmm. have to do it angrily that you extricate them, but you have to make sure that they aren't a drain on those finite resources. And I'll, I'll give another example. It's not quite the same thing, but when I, when my husband and I got married, um, and we decided, hey, we're going to have this wedding. And my father, he was like, well, I want to invite these people and these people and these people. And I thought, oh, I can invite these people and these people and these people. And my husband didn't have a whole lot because he was from another country. And so I wrote up my little list and had my spreadsheets. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. It really came out to about $125 a person. And so I asked myself, no, I think it was closer to 150 Would I like to take this person out? for a $150 dinner. And I knew I didn't have infinite $150 worth of dinners for people, so I had to prioritize. And it was so easy to whittle down that list. I whittled it down so much, it was less than 10 people that I was willing to pay for. And so my husband, sorry, my father was like, well, I want these people. I said, well, they don't fit my budget. And that was when he decided to contribute to the budget because there were people he wanted. But I knew how much I wanted to spend and I knew who was important enough to be there. Now I'm not saying it's always gonna be that cut and dry. 
but how many times have we let someone call us and keep us on a call for 15, 20, 30 minutes when we are busy attending to business for ourselves? Now, I think you get better saying, hey, I'm gonna need to call you back or I'm busy right now or whatever. But I'm sure there's at least one person that at first found it difficult to say, hey, I'm attending to something, I'm gonna have to call you back. Is there someone who can say, yes, I used to have difficulty with that? Anybody? Or am I here with people that know how to set boundaries? Yeah, I mean, to an extent, I've had issues with them, and sometimes those issues creep up depending on who it is I'm talking to. Like, it's hard, it's really hard for me to say that to my grandmother. <laughs> you know what okay. I mean? Because, you know, sometimes grandparents can get a little talkative. Um, you know, so it's like, oh, I gotta go, but I don't wanna cut her off, you know? Um, but other people, it's like, okay, I gotta go. You know what I mean? So it, it right. just depends. But I've, I've come a long way with that, but I still got a ways to go. Is your grandmother a supportive person to you, a loving person? Yeah, she is. Yeah, that's that's kind of not what I'm talking about. Has anyone oh, heard of that right. book, Getting to Know, or what's it called? Um, I think it's called Getting to Know. Has anyone ever heard of that book? And it's a book about setting boundaries. And I remember I read that, and I was like, why is this so hard? You just say no. You just say go away. You just say this or that. But there are people that do struggle with that. I can be, I'll be honest and say that I, I did struggle with that because growing up I had this thing of not wanting to disappoint people and always wanting to accommodate people. And I had a very, like, I, I never said no because I, if someone asked, that means they needed it. So I had to say yes to make someone else happy. So yes, it absolutely was hard in the beginning. I'm going to give you one of those that used to trip me up. And my mother actually used to say that to me because she was a very giving person. Um, that's not a Christian thing you're thinking. Or that's not the Christian way to do it. Now, when your mother says it, I think you should listen. If she loves you. But I have heard people say that as a way to contain their growth. That's not Christian. Don't care about only yourself. You don't need to have that much money. You don't need to work that hard. Or if you do work that hard, you should give all of this to somebody else that doesn't have any. Or you should be kind to those who are not kind to you. The turn the other cheek philosophy. So I'm for those that are devout Christians, I am not denigrating your faith. I am saying at some point, if you're trying to accomplish something that is purposeful in your life, I think even you will come to a point that's like, I'm not gonna keep turning the cheek. I'm not gonna keep giving the shirt to this particular person because they are taking all the gifts I give them and they are attacking me with it. Another spin on that, Julie, mm -hmm. real quick. Go ahead. Is that in the Bible, it says that you have to take care of your house first before you can take care of anybody else. And so those devout Christians need to focus on that phrase first. I can't give what I don't have. And until my house is whole, I can't help anybody else's house. Just a different spin on that. No, I agree, David. And I think sometimes the people who put that, you should, on somebody else from that Christian perspective are not really behaving truly to their faith. And you have to identify that. Where's this person coming from? I don't think you have to accept everybody has your best interest at heart. So here's another example. When you're raising children, and you're taking them and involving them in sports and involving them in whatever activity, the impact of that coach may or may not be consistent for what you want for your children. And I went through this with both of my kids where I basically validated the authority of that coach by bringing my kids to this person. And then I recognized at some point 
they are not helping me raise the kind of adults I want to raise. And that's when I had to take sometimes the not easy task of saying, you may not have access to my children, but you gotta pay attention to that. And these so-called coaches or teachers or whatever who are supposed to have the best interest of children at heart can do some pretty amazing damage to some children. And you have to make sure it's not yours or some other child you care about. And I consider teachers and coaches, people in my lifeboat trying to raise my children. Well, that's, they're pretty much wrong. But sometimes certain of those people had to go and you, and you gotta kick them out because they are not teaching your children or guiding your children or providing the example for your children that is in keeping with what you have decided, so that's a goal, that you want your children to head toward. Any comments about that? I think you're spot on. Okay. Now I know I wasn't invited to your wedding. You were invited to my wedding, David. You just didn't show up. <laughs> You were invited. You can't even say that because you've been my guy for a long time. But anyway, another place where I think this shows up is when people choose a coach for their business, for their life, therapist, anything like that, where they're giving you advice. I think it's important to screen those people, not only for their objectivity, but whether or not they're even capable to give you the kind of help that you need. These might be people very well-meaning, but if they're not able to give you the help that you need, then it's important that you're not going to them for that help. I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact I like to, I want to invest more time and energy into coaching people in, in real estate. Sometimes I have to recognize they're not ready for the type of coaching I can provide them. They might say, Julie, I want you to coach. And in fact, I had an interaction with someone yesterday. It was quite weird. She came up to me and she was like, you're a realtor for so-and-so and, -so and I, want to, I want to represent him because he's, he's a strong buyer, blah, blah, blah. And I was a little bit taken aback by her approach, but I said, fine. And she was like, he just doesn't work with anybody. And I said, well, I'm one of his realtors. I'm not the only one, he has others. And her question was, well, how do you get next to him? I said, well, I have integrity and I bring him value. I said, if you really want to show him that you can be of use, bring him a deal. And her question, her next thing was, well, there are no deals out there. And I was like, wow, there are lots of deals out there. So you are definitely not able to help him if you can't recognize that there are deals out there. And then her next thing was, well, can you teach me how to bring him deals? Because I'll pay you. And I was like, wow, that's a lot. And I told her quite frankly, there is no way I am prepared to help you do that. I said, you need to educate yourself on the investor space, which you clearly don't understand. And you need to spend time understanding how to determine the criteria of the client that you want to help. What are his... What are his investing criteria? What are his resources? What is it you can bring that no one else can bring? How do you present it to him in a way? What's your communication style? All of that I could tell within 15 seconds wasn't gonna work with a particular client she wanted to pursue. And so I had to tell her that. I was like, you aren't ready to help him and he's not going to let you because he suffers no fools like that. Not calling her a fool, but there is no way he's gonna spend his time with someone who is not willing to deliver to him the value that he needs for the amount of resources he has to expend. And he's very good at that. Kind of my spirit animal, I love watching him do that. The important thing I wanna to get to is that, please remember you have limited resources in life to deploy. Please have all of those resources optimally pursuing what it is you've decided to pursue. And if that's not what's happening in your life, please take the time to figure it out. Talk to someone like me or talk to someone else. How do I decide what it is that's important to me? What it is I need? 
what I have to make what I want to happen, happen? How, what are my steps to make sure that I'm following a path? Am I bringing into my journey things that are making my journey more difficult or almost impossible to accomplish? What is the best way to get these people or these distractions out of my life or at least out of my immediate priority so I can move ahead? And that's basically it. What, what are the steps I need to be able to do that? One, you have to know what you want. Two, you have to know how you're getting there. Three, you have to be able to discern if the people can and will help you get there. It doesn't matter if they're good people or not good people. They can still be working at cross purposes. Anything there? Any comments that people want to jump in on? Marsha, I know that your throat is hurting you, so please just listen. Okay, I'm gonna move on to business partnerships. And Shalena, you brought someone into my sphere just a few days ago and I was listening to them and what I said was, I don't see any reason for you guys to be in a partnership. I did not see that their goals were congruent. I did not think that their resources were equitable. When you talk about business partnerships, and for me, I have been in a disastrous one. I know without a doubt firsthand how much a waste of money, energy, and time it is, and how much it throws you off the goals you want to accomplish. But if you're still going to consider a business partnership with someone, then you need to spend a whole lot of time understanding what it is that drives them and how they are trying to accomplish that. Has anybody here been in a business partnership they care to share a little bit of information about? Please. Okay, I'm going to share about mine. Here's what happened. I was in a certain financial position. These others were not. I thought that we were looking to invest money and make it grow doing an activity that was beneficial to both of us. What I didn't recognize, what I should have paid attention to, is that they didn't even have enough money to live. So they weren't looking at growing something for the two of us. They were looking at taking as much from the pot that I contributed to, to live in the style to which they wish to become accustomed. And it took a while, but I got in kind of deep with them too quickly. And here I had all of these resources that I had invested. They had all of these resources that they had enjoyed, but they didn't come from a mutual contribution, they came from my contributions. And how do you recognize that? Well, part of the reason why they were able to get away with that is I had too much on my plate and I wasn't able to pay attention to the way my resources were being used. So that's another thing. My time was not going into the bucket. An allocation of my, my observation skills, my, my attention was elsewhere. I was trying to do this and this and this. And so I was distracted and I lost focus. And because I lost focus, I was not progressing in my goals. I was kind of just stagnating and letting someone, instead of helping me row, they were taking the water and putting it in my lifeboat that was causing both of us to sink. And then they took the life jacket and just left me with this drowning holy boat. And that was a, that was a learning experience. It was painful, humiliating, hurtful, but it helped get me on the right path. So now, in the aftermath, I feel like I learned a lesson and gained the strength. I had to go through the anger, I had to let go of that, and I had to go through what is it I'm learning, what is the gift I can get from this experience that was not pleasant to help me understand 
how not to let that kind of person into my lifeboat again. And so as I was offering this advice to somebody, be careful about those equitable partnerships. I shared, at some point, if you go into a real estate deal with someone, both of you may not want to leave at the same time. And there are inconvenient times to leave a real estate uh, purchase or a real estate ownership. And if that person is desperate for money, they can cause a sale that is detrimental to you. Either it's not appropriate for the time in your life or it's opportunity lost from keeping the deal further on. I'm in the midst of something that, like that right now. It's what's called an apartment syndication. There are many partners and there is strife. And I have a feeling just because there's strife, there's now going to be a sale of a property that is a perfectly good asset to hold on to, which is the whole reason I went into it. So when forming partnerships, when forming friendships, when forming alliances, make sure those goals are congruent. Take the time to make sure after you've identified your goals and identified your path, then look at their goals and look at their path and make sure that seems to be going into the same direction and continually assess whether or not it's going into the same direction. Because when it starts to diverge, take a look. Is that just a momentary diversion that's gonna come back or is that a splintering of your interests? which means you need to extricate yourself from that situation. Anyway, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Just please make sure that those people you have in your life are helping you do what you want. And another way to make sure of that is to make sure you're contributing to their lifeboat in a healthy way as well. Any questions or thoughts or comments? The one comment I have to that, and you already know the details, but my ex-wife and I were trying to build something and had different motivations, mm -hmm. different directions, mm -hmm. where I was about trying to build something and she was about trying to figure out how to get over for lack of a better way to say it. And that is devastating when you sit back and look at it from that perspective to say, trying to build together for the future and then realizing that that's not where they're at. Or if they are, they're trying to do it in an incongruent way that doesn't match with where I was at and what I foresee and wanted. Oh. No, that's, that's very true. Um, I think that, um, how shall I say? The value systems were different and the desired outcomes were different. Would you say that's fair? Yes, very fair. And then you had too many people involved in your situation. Everybody had a say in how you were gonna do that when they should have been quiet and to the sideline. Agreed. You know, I had a, before Christmas, I was at my favorite store where I go there and I pick out a few things from which my husband chooses a, a Christmas present for me. And so I, picked out, you know, some earrings and a necklace and whatever. And I said, if he's feeling generous, he can give me this too. Not necessary. And one of the women there was so funny. She was like, well, if he gets you all that, what are you getting? And I told her, I was like, well, you know, I'm going in with my daughter on this. And she's like, well, that's not enough. You need to give him X, Y, Z. And she caught me kind of on the wrong day. And I looked at her and I said, mm, I think I know how to dispense generosity and caring to my husband. So I've been married 25 years. How long have you been married? Have you even had a husband? Don't advise me on that, but you do not know how to do. Now, I could have in the Christmas spirit found a different way to say that, maybe, or maybe not. I don't know. That's what came out on that day. 
But I found it interesting that she felt that it was entirely appropriate to give me marital advice, marital advice, having had no husband ever of her own. There are a lot of people like that, that seek to give advice on that which they know, not at all. And you have to be careful with these so-called expert givers because they don't know how to tell you even what's best. Maybe her intention was great. I'm gonna assume that it was, but it was still not appropriate. And she wasn't in a position to help me with that anyway. Shalina, are you there still? You might have had to take off for a minute. And that's why I love you, Julie. <laughs> well, I love you too, David. And I've loved you a long time. We've been <laughs> hanging out for a while. Mm -hmm. Well, I am not one to want to waste a lot of time. Hold on, I got something from Marsha. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Great points, Julie. It kills me that my 17-year-old wants to take advice from other 17-year-olds and not from me. Who better to advise her? Yes, I'm right there with you. My son is 19 years old. And um, he likes to take advice on certain topics from his boys, like they know anything. And uh, I get it. Oh, <laughs> you have a 19 year old and, and she's the same. Here's what I try to do for my kids. I don't always succeed, so I let them live and learn the lessons that way. But I told my kids a long time ago, Remember when you were six years old and you listened to other six-year-olds about clothes to wear, toys to buy, things to do, and then you became 12? And you noticed, especially if you look back in pictures, oh my gosh, I can't believe I wore that. Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And I said, that's kind of like on steroids, what it's like to issue parental device or advice for the advice of your peers. They don't know any more than you do. And those same silly decisions you made at six that look so ridiculous at 12, look just as ridiculous to me when you're 16, when you're 18, when you're 20. Because years from now, you're going to look back, but I'm looking back now. I'm looking back at that time and I'm seeing what you're doing from the perspective of maturity and wisdom and age. And I can see how silly it looks. So just go back and ask them, do you remember when you were 12, looking back at what you looked like and did when you were six? And how cringeworthy is that? I am looking at what you're doing at 17 or 19 or 21. And it's just as cringeworthy to me now. And it will be to you as well when you are coming from the perspective of my age. And I can't guarantee you get 100% results with that, but sometimes it makes them stop and listen. So I hope that helps. But it's, it's really funny. I love pointing out my daughter's fashion sense at 12 to her now at 21. <laughs> and then I try to, to extrapolate that to other types of advice. But I did get some feedback from my daughter, her first, no, her second year of college, because now she's a junior. She used to think I was just the worst, harshest mother. I never let her do whatever she wanted. I was just a horrible, horrible mom. She didn't eat everything she wanted. I didn't let her go anywhere. I had, my husband and I were pretty strict about where our kids went and when. And when she was a junior, she was like, no, sorry, when she was a sophomore, she said to me, you know, mom, a lot of these kids aren't prepared to be at this school in this demanding environment. And they've had everything their whole lives. And I'm so thankful that you and daddy prepared us for success. 
She didn't say that when she was a teenager. I got lots of drama and tears, well not teenager, high schooler. Lots of drama and tears about everybody else's mom lets them do this and all the other kids have that and why is it that you're so difficult and blah, blah, blah. But from the perspective of just being two and a half, three years out of high school, she can see the difference in her life between where she is right now and where some of her peers are, well, who were her peers in high school. So I hope that helps with your 17 and your 19 year old. I hope that helps with anyone else that has kids, but it's just hard when they're listening to the chitter chatter of their peers to get them to understand this is gonna look just as silly to you down the road as it does to me right now, because I am already down the road. And nobody's gonna care about you as much as I do. Nobody's gonna love you as much as I do. And yet they still go that way. Marsha, let me know how that goes with your kiddos. I'd love to hear. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to mention about Shalina, she's a coach. And she's a very good coach, very caring, good communicator, good encourager. And so I am learning how to be better at coaching people. And I am choosing people to help me that are good at coaching. Now, one of my mentors in the real estate investment world is seen by some as kind of an unpleasant person, um, kind of a bully, whatever. I don't see him as that. I see him as a very forthright, direct, knowledgeable person who is able to help me grow. And sometimes that's a, an important lesson to learn. What feels like criticism, what feels like, well, I'll just leave it as, as criticism. Coming from the right source provides all kinds of sources for growth. And I try to make it a point that even if someone doesn't feel positively about me or our interaction, to get their feedback. Because generally speaking, even if they don't like me, I might find something useful in what they say. Doesn't mean that they're going to be my new best friends or anything. It just means I'm going to get some feedback. That's useful. And one of the things that Shalana said to me was that I was good at taking feedback. So sometimes somebody might come in your lifeboat and drop a pain apple on you and then leave, but maybe they left something useful for you. So don't forget those gifts as well. So anyway, I don't like to just keep talking when I'm done. If anything, if anybody has anything else they'd like to share, I'd love to discuss it. And if not, I'll close. But I hope that there was something of value in what I've said and what you've heard from others. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, darling. So, Marsha, thank you for attending. Shamir, always love talking to you, girl. Yay. And Jelena, thank you for coming on. Todd, thank you for being on Facebook Live. I hope you guys have a great night. You're welcome. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. Thank you. This was a good topic. Thank you, Julie. Oh, you're welcome. And... Hopefully, we'll get some more people next Thursday. See you at 6 p.m. We'll discuss another part. I plan to have a uh, property manager on next week. A lot of people ask me about investing, and I think it's good to speak to someone who has helped a lot of investors maximize their goals. So I'll see you next Thursday. I'll talk to y'all soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.